Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Just when you thought it couldn't get any more bizarre. Stacy Herbert. Mmm. Mmm. Max, I'm eating your cake. You're eating <laughs> my cake? Yeah. How? Tell me more. Mmm. It's really good because apparently you can have your cake, you can eat it too, and you can eat your friend's cake, and your other friend's cake, and some Joe Bag of Donuts cake. Wait a minute, I've got some cake here myself. Oh yeah. Hey, you can't be eating your cake. I'm eating it here. No, I'm eating your cake mm. over there. You've, you've rehypothecated mm. my cake over and exactly. You understand what I'm saying? Tell the people, tell the people. I see, I see. That was really sweet, that cake of yours. MF Global and the Great Wall Street rehypothecation scandal, Max. If anyone thought that you couldn't have your cake and eat it too in the world of finance, MF Global shows how you can have your cake, eat it, eat someone else's cake, and then let your clients pick up the bill. I love it. This, this modern finance is really fantastic. I can have cake that I myself have rehypothecated through the magic of derivatives trading and then re-eat it again even though I just ate it because I just re-loaned it to myself through the magic of re-re-rehypothecation. And I never have to pay anybody. I just keep eating. I'll define for everybody what hypothecation is and then what rehypothecation is. Hypothecation is when a borrower pledges collateral to secure a debt, I, very similar to a mortgage. The borrower retains ownership of the collateral, but is hypothetically controlled by the creditor who has a right to seize possession of the borrower defaults. Now, rehypothecation occurs when a bank or broker reuses collateral posted by clients to back the broker's own trades and borrowings. The practice of rehypothecation runs into the trillions of dollars and is perfectly legal. It is justified by brokers on the basis that it is a capital efficient way of financing their operations. Yes, well, people don't realize that when they sign a new account form or a margin account to be more precise, it gives the firm that they're doing business with this ability to hypothecate and rehypothecate. Yes, and that in fact was with the MF Global clients. They did sign a form that allowed MF Global to rehypothecate their funds. Now the problem arose when in the U.S. it's bankers and brokerages are only allowed to rehypothecate 140 percent of their collateral held by their clients. In the UK, however, there's no limit. There's no statutory limit to the amount that they can rehypothecate. So MF Global through London what had rehypothecated all these sovereign bonds over and over and over and over. Yes, well, when I first heard about this uh, loophole in the UK securities law that rehypothecation could happen infinitely in this continuous Mobius strip house of mirrors of fraud, my left eyeball popped. As you can <laughs> see, I'm practically bleeding out of my eyeball. I had such a unbelievable gobsmacked moment. No wonder the UK has enjoyed this debt to equity or debt to GDP ratio of a thousand percent. They simply keep reselling the same slice of cake and then loaning against that slice of cake and reloaning against it in an infinite amount of time. And everybody in the UK is, of course, drunk by five o'clock in the afternoon because they're busy rehypothecating their securities to infinity. They haven't had to work a day in their life for 10 years. Well, some are speculating that the reason why the Fed came in with all those swap lines was actually because of this rehypothecation. By 2007, rehypothecation had grown so large that it accounted for half of the activity of the shadow banking system. Prior to Lehman Brothers' collapse, the International Monetary Fund calculated that U.S. banks were receiving $4 trillion worth of funding by rehypothecation much of which was sourced from the UK. With assets being rehypothecated many times over, known as churn, the original collateral being used may have been as little as only $1 trillion, a quarter of the financial footprint created through rehypothecation. Well, what's incredible, Stacy, is that, of course, David Cameron just uh, got booted out of Europe recently uh, because he's an incompetent idiot. But uh, basically his reasoning 
And what he told the BBC, and what the BBC in turn told the people of Britain, is that David Cameron was safeguarding their financial system. What he meant to say, or failed to say, was that he's safeguarding the ability of the UK city of London to engage in this massive, infinite series of rehypothecation Ponzi scams that have decimated the balance sheet of the United Kingdom and why that country's debt is now on suicide watch. Well, Max, what the article says is because a, a lot of this rehypothecation is off balance sheet and you don't know what the collateral is and it, you don't know how many times it's been pledged over and over, they say what this creates is chains of counterparty risk where multiple rehypothecation borrowers use the same collateral over and over again. Essentially, it is a chain of debt obligations that is only as strong as its weakest link. Now, as you mentioned, this is allowed because of the UK and, and the city of London. But here in the U.S., where you have these presidential, the Republican um, presidential debates happening, everybody is focused on this $10,000 bet that uh, Mitt Romney made Rick Perry. But nobody's talking about the rehypothecation that the threat that the city of London is posing to the entire economy of the U.S. and where all of this arose from. All right, just to be clear, this kernel of fraud, this rehypothecation scandal, and the loophole that David Cameron is safeguarding by abandoning his European partners is the kernel that is responsible for the AIG meltdown, the Bernie Madoff scandal, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and now the collapse of MF Global. This all went through the city of London and this rehypothecation kernel of massive infinite fraud. So by shutting that down would be the first step the globe needs to take if it wants to get the global economy back on sure footing. You need to shut down the city of London before there's going to be any hope of any stability in the global markets. But here's where it gets very, very scary, okay? There's hyper hypothecation as well now with weak collateral rules and a level of leverage that would make Archimedes tremble Firms have been piling into rehypothecation activity with startling abandon. A review of filings reveals a staggering level of activity in what may be the world's largest ever credit bubble. And the biggest participant of this hyper hypothecation max, JP Morgan, almost more than half a trillion in rehypothecation just this year alone. Right. Well, we know that JP Morgan off balance sheet has 90 trillion in derivatives. And they say that these derivatives are completely covered through uh, counterparty coverage and through the uh, magic of value at risk accounting. Uh, what they don't tell you is that they've got trillions of unhedged rehypothecation risk on their balance sheet, including massive naked short sales in the silver futures contracts markets. So JP Morgan, as we've been saying on this show, really is worth less than zero and one day it will go the way of Enron and wake up and the stock prices at zero. In light of all of this hyper hypothecation happening via JP Morgan, there in the next headline Max, JP Morgan chases Jamie Dimon strikes back at populist anger. So this week here in the United States he was speaking at a Goldman Sachs sponsored event and he said acting like everyone who's been successful is bad and that everyone who is rich is bad I just don't get it so with that though he sounded an awful lot like somebody else from history Al Capone Al Capone in 1927 said I am going to St. Petersburg Florida tomorrow let the worthy citizens of Chicago get their liquor the best they can I'm sick of the job it's a thankless one and full of grief I've been spending the best years of my life as a public benefactor Oh, absolutely. Uh, Jamie Dimon has been the drug dealer and liquor provider in chief for a number of years. And now he's complaining. He said the strung out drunk uh, and uh, socially, uh, you know, uprising that is resulting as the result of his irresponsibility, his flagrant disregard of the law and his transgressions on just about every securities law in the, ever been written is resulting in him now complaining that, oh, what's the matter? You don't like my booze? You don't like my drugs? Well, Max, as the uh, Thomson Reuters piece pointed out, that this rehypothecation, which is dwarfs the global economy, has been providing all the liquidity, but they do note that the, it's liquidity backed by no assets. 
Well, this goes back to 2008 when the conversation was, is this a liquidity problem or an insolvency problem? And Hank Paulson and Wall Street said, well, it's a liquidity problem. We just need some short-term cash to hold us over. It's not an insolvency problem. We're not technically insolvent. We now know that they're all insolvent and that they're simply rehypothecating the same, you know, a bag of nuts uh, that they hold in their office drawer uh, to, to leverage, you know, multi-trillion dollar loan scams going back and forth. And the people who are being asked to suffer through austerity are being asked to um, suffer through austerity as a result to pay for all of this. That's why there is a global insurrection against banker occupation. Because of this la absence of justice, we're going to see these same frauds over and over again until the population demands that that happen, rather than focusing on whether or not Mitt Romney's betting $10,000 against Rick Perry. So finally, Max here, all of these fraudsters still in charge of all these banks rehypothecating and hyperhypothecating. Number of the week, finances share of economy continues to grow. So the number of the week is 8.4%. And this is the financial sector share of gross domestic product in the US that eclipses the peak hit in 2006. In 1950, by comparison, the financial sector accounted for just 2.8% of GDP. Right, well, as the financial cancer kills off pieces of the body, it's therefore a bigger percentage of the body. And there's, the, and there's no way to fend it off. Nobody's stopping it. I remember Steve Keen had said that the, the maximum number that it should be is 4% according to uh, mathematical models. Well, <laughs> according to the model that would encourage actual labor creating actual manufactured goods in a real economy. Uh, you don't want that banking sector not to be more than 4 or 5%. To be 10, 20, or 30 percent in the UK, if you were to factor in all the industries that are controlled either directly or indirectly by the City of London, it's almost 50 percent of the entire GDP of the UK is uh, conducted by the hyper hypothecating fraudulent kernel that is the City of London under the non regulation of the FSA, the SFO, and David, you know, numbnuts Cameron. My final word here is I'm going to eat Alec Baldwin's cake here. And um, he'll see, we'll see how funny it is to go bankrupt. He doesn't realize how easy it is to go bankrupt here. He's making fun of American Airlines for being bankrupt. I'll show him how it happens. You see? <laughs> oh, Alec Baldwin. Yeah, yes. There he is going bankrupt. Oops, <laughs> Alec Baldwin, I'm eating your cake. Very good, Stacey Herbert. Well, that's excellent. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. <laughs> Don't go away. Much more coming your way. So stay right there. Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to New York. Talk with Reggie Middleton of BoomBusBlog.com, where you can find exclusive and valuable forensic analysis. Reggie, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Well, thank you, sir. All right, Reggie, two months ago, here on the Kaiser Report, you warned the audience about German debt. You were right. Where do you expect German debt to trade going forward? It's a two-fold story. Right now, German debt is the flight to quality trade, apparently, and uh, everybody who's concerned about the more profligate states in the monetary union in the EU uh, are basically running to the German bonds. I think, from a personal opinion and also from the outside looking in, that they're failing to take a realistic look at the situation. Germany is an export nation, a strong economy, but primarily an export economy. They export to the same nations who everybody's running away from. So Germany may be the best of a lot, but a lot that's in the same situation. Think of a Roche Motel. Uh, Germany lives in the same Roche Motel as everybody else. They just have to pan how sweet. So if S&P downgrades German and French debt, is the Eurozone finished? The downgrades, in my opinion, uh, are at the consternation of the European political officials. But uh, much of that debt should have been AA and AAA rated anyway. I noticed problems starting in 2009. The problems were uh, explicit in 2010, and they were getting worse, yet they were carrying um, strong investment grade ratings. Uh, usually, S&P and the other rating agencies um, appear to a pile of ashes with a fire hose looking to put a fire out at a house. They always get there too late. Instead of c complaining about the downgrades, uh, what investors should be doing is complaining about why the downgrades are coming in such an untimely fashion after the fact. All right, now uh, you talk about Germany having the penthouse suite at the Roche Motel. Let's talk about America for a second. Now, American banks have been writing credit default swaps on European sovereign debt 
Uh, will they be able to cover these insurance products if the European nations default? It all depends if they can um, wiggle out of having the default being declared a default. Uh, as you may know, a lot of the uh, stakeholders are trying to say that a default will not be a default because it will be, quote unquote, a voluntary loss of your money, um, which is oxymoronic. It makes no sense um, who voluntarily loses their money. So if they can wiggle out of a credit default event, uh, the U.S. banks may survive. Uh, I, or may survive and possibly flourish because they took the CDS premiums and never had to pay out. It's like getting paid for insurance, never having to pay for the loss. Um, as for that coming to fruition and happening, um, it seems like a long shot. You know, at the very least, you will have litigation for years. One very interesting uh, point on this is an article that was written by or published by Reuters when they examined MF Global and MF Global's fall. In a nutshell, MF Global was using excessive leverage stemming from hypothecation and rehypothecation of securities. Basically, they took client securities and they used it as collateral against their own very risky bets against the European debt. Um, this, these bets were multiples of their equity. And of course, as soon as things started going against them, they were getting margin calls, the whole Ponzi collapsed, and $1.2 billion in counting of client money has been missing. This level of leverage is totally off balance sheet, okay, not visible or available to investors, and is not endemic to just MF Global. Uh, Lehman Brothers did it, uh, Goldman Sachs is doing it, JP Morgan's doing it, and they're doing it with more than two or three dollars. If I'm not mistaken, the exposure to Goldman Sachs is about 51 billion, 27 to 51 billion. Uh, JP Morgan is doing it to the churn of several hundred billion, over a hundred billion. This level of leverage, um, combined with the fact that you have CDS that may have a claim or may not have a claim, combined with the fact that the underlying collateral behind the bets are decreasing significantly. If I'm, um, Greece is trading at an average of about 27 cents on a dollar now means that you have a Ponzi house of cards that if it collapses are going to take several systems down, not just European banks, but it's bound to drag other banks with it. So I'm curious to see what will happen, but I think that there's going to be a major reset of the system from a financial entity perspective coming. The only problem is when. You know, you can't time it, but I don't see a way out of it because we have lots of debt, we have lots of risk, very, very little equity or negative equity and we have little, relatively little income and revenue because of austerity measures and declining economies. And this is across Europe, the U.S., and Asia, with China being, you know, the number prime example. Right now, keeping on the MF Global story, I don't know if you saw this news or not, but it turns out that there is a regulatory loophole in London, in the city of London, that allows for this rehypothecation scandal that takes on a new dimension. Because in the United States, the level of hypothecation or rehypothecation can run at 140 percent or so if you've got those uh, government securities that you're lending against or margining against. However, in the UK, that number is infinite. There is no top. There is no ceiling to the amount of relending or rehypothecating you can do. It goes on in infinitely. And for this reason, MF Global, their, their key uh, component of their firm ran through London, as did Lehman Brothers, as did AIG, as did Bernie Madoff. Why doesn't somebody wake up and turn this loophole, shut it down in London? Because it's clearly at the root of the entire global meltdown. Your thoughts? I uh, take a look at the firms that you mentioned and see uh, what lobbying dollars went where. Everybody has a constituency, okay, and I think often the layperson uh, assumes that um, there are, they are their representative's constituency. Um, that may be the case if you look at it, the marketing material from certain elected or appointed uh, representatives, but in reality that's not the case. You know, your constituency are the people who empower you, whether it's empowered by vote or by economic means. So in other words, when David uh, Cameron talks about safeguarding the city of London, what he's talking about is safeguarding this incredible loophole of fraud that is really at the, the genesis of the global uh, collapse is what he's safeguarding. But now, shortly before uh, MF Global went bust, uh, Reggie Middleton, they were granted primary dealer status. Uh, can you tell us what that means exactly, uh, a primary dealer, and what that gives them in terms of privileges? Well, it's interesting. They are, a primary dealer is a bank 
uh, or financial entity that has been blessed by the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government to be able to broker, buy, sell, and resell um, U.S. government debt on a first come basis. They basically act as a go between between the government and um, buyers. In order to do that, I think there's only, I can't remember, there may be between 12 and 17 primary dealers. I forget the exact number. But in order to get that status, you have to be vetted by the government. Um, and one of the reasons, of course, would be that you have to be credible. You have to have the financial stability and strength to do that. They were just given primary dealer status, what, between one to three months before they went bankrupt, which begs the question exactly how thorough did the Federal Reserve vet MF Global? Or a better question is, what did they vet them for? Obviously, they didn't vet them for risk management or uh, financial stability. And even if you give the Federal Reserve a pass, um, MF Global was still overseen by the CFTC and the CME. So with this extreme vetting process of the most powerful regulatory and financial entities in the world, um, MF Global got a pass and collapsed between one and three months later. You know, their track record is 100% uh, inverse to what you consider credible. Gosh, I hope the I hope uh, the White House does a better job vetting their Secret Service agents, uh, or, or they, we got some trouble in the White House. <laughs> now let's uh, let me. So, <laughs> so your thoughts? Um, you know the um, there, there are reports of fraud. You know reverse wire transfers, all kinds of fraud. Uh, D Reggie Middleton, are you telling people? Uh, about their own brokerage accounts uh, that, you know, some pundits, some firm managers, some money managers are actually pulling out of funds from brokerage. They just don't see it as being a safe place anymore. Your thoughts? Is it safe to keep your funds in a brokerage uh, anymore? You have a significant risk that a lot of people didn't uh, anticipate before. Um, I just, Seton Hall University, which is, uh, I think, one of the only private law universities in New Jersey, came up with a report where they uh, basically reviewed the review of Lehman Brothers collapse from 2008. And their conclusions was that despite the fact that there was blatant uh, fraudulent actions, blatant um, backtating of risk management measures to make uh, Lehman Brothers operations look less risky than they were, despite the fact it was evident that business was collapsing, they did not break or violate enough mandates, laws, or regulations to justify a step on the risk. You know, that in itself tells you how much risk you're taking when you put your money in a brokerage account. What happened to MF Global is essentially what happens to, um, what can happen to any other uh, bank. My grandmother used to always tell me, you never, there's never one roach. If you see a roach, there are other roaches there. You know, you haven't come across it. So what MF Global did, Goldman is currently doing. If you take a look at my website, you'll see where Goldman Sachs had reduced their derivative exposure and increase their sovereign debt exposure at the same time that the derivative bubble was, uh, you know, had popped, or was finished popping, and the sovereign debt bubble is expanding. So they did exactly what they shouldn't have done at the exact wrong time. And if you also look at the Reuters report, you see that they have significant leverage off balance sheet and almost untraceable due to hypothecation and rehypothecation and repledging. And this is off balance sheet. So if you look at this amount of leverage, you look at the amount of risk they're taking, you look at their timing, which is basically awful, uh, I just couldn't feel safe with my money's there. The best way to do it is to split your monies around several accounts, but you just don't have a law, according to the Seton Hall report, that creates a consequence for wrongdoing. So exactly. So in other words, people say, is my money safe in a brokerage account? The brokerage account will say, even though we've lost all this customer money, we didn't break any laws. Uh, I think that should be your tip exactly. off. <laughs> you know, if they don't think they, that's, <laughs> if they think stealing money is, is a good idea, then if you keep your money at, that, at a brokerage account, then you deserve kind of the, what, what you get. Now, finally, uh, Reggie Middleton, you've always been ahead of the rating agencies on really identifying true state of risk and what the next big risk coming down the pike is. You were very early and very right on the whole housing collapse. So tell us, give us a preview, what the next big sector or, or stock or commodity that you see that you're telling your, uh, the people that follow you is gonna be the next big risk uh, hotspot. I think the next big risk is the last big risk that nobody paid attention to. The counterparty risk with the banks is excessive. You know, the amount of leverage that they're instituting with the uh, minimum equity and the lack of any real discipline is outrageous. And despite that, you know, 
people are still bidding up stocks. You know, people are still uh, putting bids on the assets that have a very gloomy future. I think that the banking industry should be mark to market in general. Okay, when you have strong banks, let them trade. But it's very difficult for, to say XYZ Bank is strong when it is highly leveraged into banks that are three seconds from blowing up and being held up only by um, the assistance from the European Central Bank or the Fed, etc. And the problem with the banking system, the global banking system, is it's so highly interconnected. You know, it's only as weak, it's only as strong as its weakest link, and its weakest link is ready to pop momentarily. All right, Reggie Middleton, we're out of time. Thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. You're very welcome. Look forward to coming back. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Reggie Middleton of BoomBusBlog.com. If you'd like to send me an email, please do so at KaiserReport at RTTV.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.